Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school. And that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. It's time to talk about one of our sponsors of today's episode, AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now, many of you have heard me say this before, but I am not a fan of vegetables, which I know is funny given I've been in the health and fitness industry for so long. I blame my mother and father for this when I was a kid. What they would do was essentially take the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, the spinach, the collard greens, and just steam them. No salt, no fat, no taste whatsoever, just these bitter greens. And so I developed a distaste for a lot of different vegetables, which has stayed with me into adulthood. One of the things I've done to mitigate that is use a greens powder pretty much ever since greens powders have come out on the market. And I've tried every single one. They started out tasting like swamp water. I found a few that I really like the taste. But recently, one that I have been taking for a very long time, as you all know, I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I found that it was actually spiking my blood sugar because probably the tapioca starch in it, which some people don't respond to tapioca starch with elevated blood sugars, I was. And so it sent me on a mission to find another one. And one of my friends turned me on to AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now I've heard about Athletic Greens and AG1 for quite some time. I just never tried it. And now that I have tried it, I have become a huge fan. So much so that I partnered with Athletic Greens and AG1 to sponsor this podcast. Now let me tell you what happened here? After I saw that my blood sugars were spiking, my friend gave me a couple samples of AG1. I began using those and testing the blood sugar and found there was no spike. The other thing I found is that AG1 is interested in its taste profile. It's very neutral. The one I was taking before was a little sweet. I really loved it. But this one is very neutral, which actually suits me because what I found is I can actually not only take this first thing in the morning in water, and have it taste very neutral, almost like there's nothing there, I can also add it into my protein shakes, which means now I'm getting double the greens than I was getting previously, because I add this right into my protein shakes, and it does not change the flavor of the shake at all. The other thing I realized once I started looking at the label is that this product is not simply a greens product. It also is a multivitamin, multimineral. It also has fiber, which acts as a prebiotic. It has probiotics in it, and it has functional mushrooms, which act as adaptogens in it. That's four different products essentially in one. And I've been taking mushrooms for some time. I stopped taking them now because now I have this in my greens. I have also taken my multivitamin and make this my multivitamin. So I'm actually saving money and this is going to save you money as well. The product AG1 is also NSF certified. And you might say, Jade, what does that mean? The National Sanitation Foundation is a foundation that essentially does testing on products to make sure there are no harmful substances, no persistent organic pollutants, no heavy metals. Now, this costs money to do. AG1 and Athletic Greens has spent the money on this. They spend money on making sure that the product that you are getting is good quality without contamination in it. You might say, well, Jade, isn't this true of all products? And actually, no, it is not. If you ever follow some of the news in this area through con uh, consumer labs and other things that do uh, you know, testing on these products, 
you'll see that many of them will have trace levels of things like mercury and cadmium and lead and things like that in them because they're not doing this testing. So this is an extra piece of insurance for us. The other thing I love about this product that I learned as I was doing my research on it is that this is the 52nd tweak or adjustment they have made to this product in their existence. AG1 has been tweaked 52 times. Now you might say, well, Jade, why would they be doing that? And the reason why is because they continue to improve. We know that science is evolving. We know that it's not just about more nutrients. It's about balanced nutrients. It's about the Goldilocks effect of this. And they are constantly learning as we all are, and then constantly adjusting their product to taste better, to be more efficient and effective in delivering the nutrients. It acts as an antioxidant. It acts as a multivitamin. It's a prebiotic, a probiotic, and an adaptogen all in one. They have mastered this over several iterations of this particular product. And so I am a huge fan right now of AG1 and Athletic Greens. And I'm hoping that you will check this out. It's time for all of us to reclaim our health and arm our immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And AG1 does that with just one scoop in a cup of water every single day. That is all you need. There is now no longer a need for a million different pills and supplements to look after your health. All you need is this particular one. It really clears the stage to simplify your supplement regime. To make it easy for you, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash next level. That's athleticgreens.com slash next level to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Check out AG1. I love it. I know you're going to love it. And I'm so happy that they are on board to sponsor the podcast as well. Thanks so much. Check out AG1, athleticgreens.com slash next level. And let's get back to the show. All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's show. Today, we're going to do sort of a follow-on podcast from the last episode, which was on Purpose and pain. And I got a lot of feedback from all of you on that last episode. Um, It is one of these things that all of us humans struggle with, uh, something that is always in the back of our mind and something that I think a lot of people are hungry for, but it's not talked about a lot, which is why this podcast is making it it's sort of one of its major goals to begin talking about how to handle suffering. And along with suffering and pain and turning that into purpose is the idea of resolve and resilience and grit and courage in the face of difficulty. And so this particular talk is a version of the talk I gave at A4M along with the uh, talk on pain and purpose that you heard last in last week's episode. So these two episodes sort of go hand in hand. So I believe last week was 187. Uh, This week is episode 188. And so you're going to want to uh, make sure you look at uh, perhaps that one first, if you want. Um, 187 was two weeks ago, actually. And then this one is going to be 189. So this is a follow on from two episodes ago. So 187 episode and 189 sort of go together. If you haven't listened to 187, you may want to listen to that um, as well. doesn't matter which one comes first, but they are designed to kind of go together. So let's get into this topic of resilience. The first thing I want to uh, sort of just draw your attention to is some of the things that uh, I want to cover and make you aware of. And first of all, the differences between physiological and psychological resilience. Because obviously in this podcast, we talk an awful lot about metabolism. You know that's one of my areas of expertise. And certainly we can speak about resilience from the metabolic standpoint, the physiological standpoint. We can also talk about resilience from the psychological standpoint. And today we're really going to be focusing on psychological resilience and how it differs uh, from physiological resilience. 
And also, there's a lot of talk about grit, if you're familiar with Angela Duckworth and her very popular TED Talk. Um, oftentimes, resilience and grit sort of are seen as the same. Uh, and they're also seen as sort of synonyms with courage as well. And in this talk, I'm going to try to define these a little bit differently to show you that they're not exactly the same thing. Uh, we're going to talk about the elements that may contribute to psychological resilience and of course, the role of purpose in overcoming adversity, which is why episode 187, along with this episode 189, might be important for you. And then what I want to do at the end of this is I want to give you a simple model of how you can begin to program resilience in yourself or some tools you can use. Now, let's start with the metabolism idea of resilience. This is something that you probably heard before if you're a longtime listener of this podcast. And I oftentimes talk about this as the model of metabolism is usually defined uh, in two different ways, either as a chemistry set or a calculator. And it also is defined as either a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism. And one of the things that I have been pushing for a very long time is that we need a different model for metabolism. It's probably best described as a stress barometer and thermostat. And the reason why is it's adaptive and reactive. Now that right there, that term adaptive and reactive tells you something about resilience, because if you're going to be resilient, whether physiologically or psychologically, you're going to need to adapt. You're going to need to react. You're going to need to be able to respond in an appropriate way. And so when we talk about the metabolism responding physiologically to stress, we really oftentimes can see this from the perspective of the sensing and responding uh, nature of metabolism. It senses stress and it responds to stress. And the ability for it to sense stress is a really important aspect of this. And so the way it typically works is the metabolism will pick up signals from the outside world. These are gonna be things like uh, temperature, um, what season it is, uh, you know, uh, food availability, type of food, uh, psychological stress, and this is where this particular episode is going to really uh, come in handy because obviously what we think about the world determines how we might respond to the world. In fact, Trauma, especially at a uh, young age, can set up our metabolic machinery in a way to make us more or less responsive to future stress. In other words, what I'm saying is the way we think about the world is determined by some of the adverse events we've had in life and that, that those adverse events and that uh, way of seeing the world, whether we see the world as safe or unsafe, whether we see the world as loving or dangerous, can then determine how we internalize all future stresses. And so these things are completely linked. So metabolism physiologically is certainly linked to metabolism psychologically. And of course, we're going to focus on the psychological aspect today. Now, of course, not only are we responding to outside events in metabolism, but we're also responding to inside the body events, how the mitochondria are respiring, how many reactive oxygen species they are creating, uh, how much ATP we're able to generate versus ADP. For those of you who aren't familiar with the terms I'm using right now, I'll just briefly explain this. In each cell, there's these little energy factories called mitochondria. And when mitochondria do their work to create energy, they can burn that energy very cleanly and produce a lot of good quality energy, or they can uh, burn that energy very dirty. Think of this like a coal plant versus, uh, you know, a hydroelectric power plant using sort of water. Uh, the coal plant is going to be dirty. It has a lot of uh, sort of uh, carbon output, smoke, so to speak, that it creates as it's uh, doing its job. Now, when a mitochondria spews out this coal smoke, we call that reactive oxygen species. These things can do damage around the body. And so our antioxidant defenses have to work against that. And certainly also the ability to produce more ATP, which is essentially the energy, the electricity that the, the cell creates, the mitochondria create, 
versus lack of electricity, which would be ADP. In other words, the mitochondria inside the body when they're making when it's making its energy are also sending signals that the metabolism in the brain are picking up. Uh, and this is going to determine some of its response or its needs. And so we also have toxins, circadian dysregulation, infection, inflammation, injury, all these things the metabolism is responding to to get itself back to homeostasis. Now, the thing that I'm really trying to draw your attention to here is that there are ways in which we can understand how the metabolism is responding physiologically, how much stress it is under physiologically. I oftentimes talk about this as this acronym you all know me for, SHMEC, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. When SHMEC, S-H-M-E-C, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings are out of check, it's an indication that the metabolism is physiologically under stress and not being able to be very resilient physiologically. It's not able to bounce back. If it was, then sleep, hunger, mood, energy and cravings, exercise performance, exercise recovery, all these things would be more balanced. And so the, the thing that I'm pointing out here for everyone is that if you look at this from a physiological perspective and to see how resilient the metabolism is from a physiological perspective, we can look at these biofeedback sensations of sleep, hunger, mood, energy, cravings, or what I call SHMEC, which many of you who listen to this podcast know that SHMEC, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and qu cravings, is also a catch-all phrase for all biofeedback sensations in the body. So this would include exercise performance and exercise recovery and libido and erections and um, digestive dysfunction and joint pain and headaches and signs and symptoms and, you know, all of these sort of things. And so we want to understand, and many of you do understand through your own study and reading, that the metabolism is sending signals all the time. And you've probably learned to speak some of its language. So you know that when you're hungry or craving or having unpredictable energy uh, and disrupted sleep, that you might be under too much stress and you need to do something to balance that out. But what about psychological stress? How do you know if your body is under psychological stress? How do you know if the psychological stress that we all are, uh, you know, sort of being uh, confronted with in our lives is keeping you from adapting and reacting and keeping you from being less resilient? And also, how do you know that the stories that you're telling yourself about life your belief about life, whether it's safe or dangerous or whether people are mean or good, uh, past traumas, whether you've been abused in some way, emotionally, physically uh, betrayed in some way. How do you know that these old traumas haven't created some psychological rigidity and keep are now keeping you from having resilience? Well, just like their sleep, hunger, mood, energy and cravings when it comes to physiological responses and understanding whether you are physiological, physiologically resilient, I'm going to suggest that there is also a way to understand whether you are psychologically resilient or psychologically rigid. And I'm going to give you another acronym. So we have the acronym SHMEC for metabolic flexibility or resilience. But what about psychological flexibility or resilience? And here is the acronym I want to uh, give you. The acronym is AFRAID, A-F-R-A-I-D, AFRAID, which stands for, and we're going to go backwards here because I do believe that um, when we talk about this particular acronym, you want to think about the AFRAID acronym as a hierarchy. You know, so with the last letter in this acronym, D, being depression and being the deepest, most entrenched form of an emotional uh, rigidity. So the D here stands for depression, which in my way of thinking about depression is the inability to find hope. The I in the AFRAID acronym, working backwards, is insecurity, which is the inability to believe in self. The A is anxiety, inability to make a choice. The R is resistance, inability to act. The F, frustration, inability to process what has happened in your life. 
And the first A, anger, which is an inability to really move on. And when you think about this AFRAID acronym, depression, insecurity, anxiety, resistance, frustration, and anger working from backwards on that, or anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, depression, working the acronym forward to backward. The important thing to understand here is that just like Schmeck, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings, afraid, anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, and depression are a sign or a warning signal, just like the check pressure gauge in your car for your tires. When you are afraid, feeling anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, and depression, and more importantly, living in these emotional states, being stuck in these emotional states, it tells you that you have some degree of psychological rigidity and are not able to be psychologically resilient in the way you might want. Now, right away, this might be challenging some of you. What I would ask is simply wait before you react, Keep an open mind to try to understand what we are saying here. And I'm going to say it one more time because this can be complex. What we are saying here is that there is a degree of physiological resilience or rigidity. The way we, we react physically, metabolically, the biochemistry of our body. And we talk about that as schmeck, sleep, hunger, mood, energy and cravings and all other biofeedback signals. When these things are out of check. It is a good indication that you are physically not able to be resilient. AFRAID is a new acronym we're presenting today that you have probably never heard me talk about. And this AFRAID acronym, anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, and depression, is the psychological equivalent to Schmeck. When you are stuck in AFRAID, any of these emotions, anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, depression, just as Schmeck is an indication that you are not metabolically resilient, this tells you when you are afraid, stuck in any of these emotions, that you may not be able to psychologically be resilient. And so this is a new way to understand some of these emotions. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about with emotions is the following, because a lot of people might say, well, Jade, aren't we supposed to feel these emotions, like isn't anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, and depression, isn't this useful and necessary? Shouldn't we be in emotional integrity? Shouldn't we feel these things? The answer to that is absolutely. However, emotions are meant to be felt, not lived. And what I mean by that is that emotions are supposed to be felt, be examined, be used as guideposts to learn, just like we talked about in episode 187, that when you have an emotional reactivity, this is sort of like a bleeding wound and you have to tend to it. But if you are stuck in an emotion, what this means is that you're not tending to this bleeding wound. You're actually not doing what you need to do to take care of this. And you're having some degree of psychological rigidity. Now, this is a hypothesis. It's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why I am going back and getting my PhD in transpersonal psychology, because I want to study this particular hypothesis and see how much uh, water it holds to see if it's actually a viable hypothesis. I certainly have seen this clinical, but right now it's a clinical model, not necessarily an evidence based model, but I'm presenting this hypothesis to you, hoping it is useful for you, because I do know that it is useful clinically, how much it translates into an actual viable evidence-based model remains to be seen. But it hopefully you can see the utility of going, is my Schmeck in check? Yes or no, that tells me a bit about my physical metabolic resilience. And am I stuck in afraid or not? And that tells me a little bit about my psychological uh, flexibility and resilience. And once again, afraid is anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, and depression. And you want to look at this acronym as starting from least entrenched, most able to move you out of this stuckness 
to deepest entrenched and least ability to get you out of this stuckness. In other words, anger is a far more useful emotion to move you out of dysfunction and get you into a resilient state than is depression. Depression is very difficult as a very low energy signature in a sense. We all know what this is like. When we feel depressed, it's difficult to find hope to move forward. However, when we feel anger, anger is all oftentimes the catalyst to motivation and drive and focus. And it's pretty easy to move from anger into taking action to do something beneficial. It's more difficult to move from depression to action. And that's why this afraid acronym goes from most sort of energetic in anger to least energetic with depression. So hopefully that's making sense. And it's important. And I'm harping on this because as we go through today's episode, uh, it's going to be important that you uh, understand what we're talking about here. I'm sorry to break into the show, but I wanted to take a second to cover one of our sponsors and tell you all about Paleo Valley at paleovalley.com. These are the grass-fed sticks that I tell you all so much about that all of my friends know I have on hand constantly. They are in my car. They are at my house. I keep them at my sister's home and my parents' house. I have these things everywhere because they are the simplest, most convenient whole foods protein supplement you can get. Almost like carrying around pure protein, low carb protein in your pocket. They also, these Paleo Valley beef sticks are the only the only 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef sticks on the market. They use organic spices. They are naturally fermented instead of using nitrates and nitrites that can be a problem in some of these cured meats, and they simply taste fantastic. Check out the original or the jalapeno. Those are my favorites. Please make sure you go over to paleovalley.com and visit when checking out, use the code next level for a 15% discount. Remember, our sponsors keep the show going by you giving them your patronage and spending your money on these high quality products. You actually do a few things. One, you're helping to support the podcast. And two, you are helping your health. And three, you are making sure that good quality companies like Paleo Valley can be out there doing their business, changing the world, making the earth better. One of the things you may not know about this is that grass-fed organic and grass-finished beef is doing something that is so utterly important for our environment, actually helping to repopulate the topsoil. A lot of people don't know this, but our topsoil is being extremely depleted and raising animals, especially cattle, the correct way helps to get that topsoil back. This is one of the reasons why I love Paleo Valley, not to mention it tastes fantastic, but they're one of these companies like my other sponsors, Cured Nutrition and Organifi that are doing the right things by the environment. I really appreciate everything they do and I hope you will check them out. Thanks so much. Paleovalley.com. Use the code next level. And now back to the show. So, just one more time, physical resilience comes down to metabolic flexibility and we can use Schmeck as a good determination, a general determination about whether we are metabolically, physically metabolically resilient. And we can use AFRAID, this acronym, to see if we are psychological resilient. Now, one of the things that is determinant of not just a little bit, but highly determinant of whether or not we are going to have psychological resilience and be stuck in the emotions of afraid or not is our belief, our belief in self, most importantly, the belief others have in us as well, and most importantly, perhaps the belief that the hard things that happen to us can be used to help us get better and grow. As a matter of fact, when I look at the research, which is really difficult, kind of all over the place in terms of what we need to think about purpose and resilience and what makes someone have grit or courage or rise up to difficult times in their lives. It really comes down to me three things when you really sort of look at the totality of the research that I have looked at. 
And those three things are belief in self, belief others have in you, and the belief that stressful, hard traumas, tribulations, trials can be used to grow and get better. And in fact, that that may be their very purpose. That may be their very purpose. Now, one of the things to understand about resilience and to understand about this afraid acronym and the the propensity for us to get stuck in these emotions is to think about um, going on your own hero's journey. And I did a episode on being a hero uh, in the past. And I'm going to just really quickly check here because this is another thing that you're probably going to want to um, review here because being a hero and the idea of being a hero is very important, especially when we contract it with being a victim. And we're going to get to this in just a minute because victim mindset is the opposite of hero mindset and being stuck in victim mindset is going to keep you from being a hero. Now, the hero episode is episode 167. So to follow along with this episode, you're probably going to want to listen to episode 167 and episode 187. This episode is 189. And this is going to be a really good one, two, three punch to get what I'm talking about here. But to become resilient, to believe in yourself, to get other people to be on board with what you're doing and to have the steadfast resolve that your trials and tribulations can be used to make you better. You need to see yourself in my way of seeing it as being on a hero's journey. So let's go through this hero's journey really quickly. What happens in a hero's journey. And as we're talking about this, you can think about this from any good movie you've ever seen. One of the things that happens is when you enter into a good story, whether your story, the story of your life, the one you're living right now, or a movie or a book, one of the things that happens is you get this lightning strike moment, this thing that happens where everything changes. There's abuse maybe, there's betrayal, someone dies, something happens that turn, someone gets fired from their job, someone breaks up with their lover, whatever it is, something difficult happens in life that changes everything. And once this trial, this trauma, this tribulation, this difficulty, this pain, this hurt, this suffering happens, it throws the person into disarray, into a place of uncertainty and discomfort. And the normal response to that is at first a place of resistance. When something happens that changes everything, we want to resist. We want to go back to certainty, even if that place of certainty wasn't necessarily the best place for us or was doing us the best good. And the reason why is because we humans, we prefer the devil we know versus whatever we don't know, because we go, well, I'm handling this thing just fine, no matter how tough it is. And I can't predict the future. I definitely don't want things to be worse. And we would rather stay in certainty than take the chance. This is what many people will do. And this is what resistance does for us. And resistance is this place where we are unable to accept. We deny there's a refusal to change. We have a tendency to blame. We have, you know, sort of this victim mindset. It's someone else's fault. Here we have, this is where repeated emotions come in, familiar patterns, recurrent obstacles come up. And we sort of get stuck in this vortex of hurt, which is a lot of it is self-imposed. And if you want to be resilient psychologically, you need to understand the very normal, but also very destructive tendency of us humans to go into a place of resistance after we have these traumatic events, we go into a place oftentimes of denial and unable to accept a tendency to blame, to complain, to whimper, to whine, to deny and to distract. This is what we do. And this is the state of resistance. Now, with this state of resistance, we have to at some point, if we're going to escape this and rest assured, Many people don't. This is why resilience is very difficult and relatively rare. Many people don't. But what has to happen to get out of resistance is a change in perception, a change in the way we see the story. 
And this is where the victim mindset and the hero mindset come in very strongly because we can and we should be victims for a time. When things happen that are difficult, it is appropriate and it is good and it is something that is valuable to um, have some uh, level of crying and uh, sitting in the pain and uh, feeling sorry for ourselves and wanting help and uh, feeling the negative aspects of this. Everyone has the right to be a victim for a time. And as good humans, we should also uh, realize that we should allow people to be victims for a time. No one would you know, see someone get hit by a car, run up to them right away and say, hey, get up and walk it off. It's no big deal. Instead, we would have empathy. We would tend to them. We would uh, understand if they got up and started yelling at the driver, you know, or reacted in some emotional way. However, four months later, after this accident happened, if the person is still complaining about their accident, blaming the, the driver and acting this way, we may not be as amenable to this mindset. Right. And so, yes, being a victim for a time is important, but everyone at some point must make a choice to cease being the victim. And let's face it, many people don't. Many people continue to be the victim. Many people live victim. And if you're living victim, in my way of uh, looking at this, you're living afraid. You're being stuck in one of these emotions, the afraid emotions. Does this make sense? Hopefully this is making sense. So it's not to say that we shouldn't, uh, you know, take care of victims and we, sh we should pretend like people aren't victims. It's simply to say that at some point the victim has to make a choice to move out of victim, to stop living in victim. And if they don't, they are only hurting themselves and they're compounding the injury further. And this is a perceptual shift. It's a re realization. And that starts with an acceptance of what happened and an awareness of the underlying stories. Oftentimes, uh, and this is going to seem a little bit woo-woo perhaps, but I have a theory uh, that oftentimes perhaps the entire point of pain and suffering is to force us to look deeply and critically at the stories that we're telling ourselves. For example, one story might be that you know, my lover, my significant other, my romantic partner um, is always going to be there and I can rely on them and I can outsource some of my worthiness, some of my self-esteem and some of my need to take care of myself to them. And this is normal, right? We would all sort of agree with this. However, we also understand that your lover can leave. Your lover can cheat on you. Your lover can betray you. Your lover can die. And all of a sudden, that seed story, that underlying story of that they can, they should, and they are part of my life that is going to be there forever blows up in whatever way, shape, or form as a reminder that as adults, we know full well that in the end, we are ultimately always responsible for self. And the degree to which we outsource that responsibility is the degree to which we remain vulnerable. Now, being vulnerable is wonderful. So we certainly need to be vulnerable to let love in and to let people take care of us. However, we also always have to stay in control of who we are and take control of our own lives and not outsource completely our sense of worthiness, self-esteem, and our ability to take care of ourselves. So when you move out of resistance, you get to this place where you go, okay, I need to take care of myself. I need to take ownership. I need to, regardless of whose fault it was, I need to be someone who accepts what happens, no matter how bad it is, take ownership of it and realize that I have to separate myself from my old self. I have to kill off the old person who believed in these stories that kept me stuck. And I need to begin to write new stories, to move in a different direction, and to see this as growth for change so that I can rise from the ashes of who I was to who I am meant to be. This is resilience at its core. Resilience essentially says, you just got your ass beat. Now, rise up 
Learn from the lessons and be different. Kill your old self, birth your new self. This is ultimately what it's all about. And in life, if we're doing life correctly, we are constantly killing our old selves and birthing our new selves. And once we get this realization, what we are confronted with is this idea that, oh my gosh, I can be something different. And that's exciting. And we also are confronted with this idea of, oh my gosh, I can be something different and that's terrifying. And so we have to begin walking this road where we begin to understand that who we want to be and who we were are oftentimes at odds. And there's going to be this gap in understanding. And so we're going to need to have new experiences and develop new knowledge and begin to grow in a different way. And this is where wisdom comes in, right? This is where this idea of wisdom, where knowledge plus experience brings us new insights and new information and a new way of being becomes critical for resilience. And so we travel this road and along that road, we develop humility. Uh, we begin to admit that we don't know. We begin facing fears and our failures and realizing that we are dysfunctional human beings. And we start to take responsibility more for our choices and actions. And we begin living what Rilke, uh, Rilke describes as living into the answer. And this is when oftentimes purpose begins to emerge and resilience begins to become a dominant feature of our personality. And once this begins to happen, now we can get more into a purpose-driven life, a desire to create. We start realizing that life is not about reward, acknowledgement, and reciprocation. We start living for the sake of living. We start doing for the sake of doing. We start giving for the sake of giving. We start being different. There's an old saying that the person who loves to walk will walk far further than the person who loves the destination. And the point of that sort of uh, quote is to understand that when you begin to love the journey of life and you begin to see both compliments and criticisms as fuel for growth and fear and failure, as well as fun as being just as useful and that growth is about good things and bad things, you all of a sudden start to be in a much more resilient state. But I want to jump in real quick and tell you about one of my favorite new products. And to start out, I want to ask you a question. If you had to follow your friends around who are not the healthiest in the world and see what they are doing, what would be the number one thing you would probably tell them to do to start? For most people, that's going to be drinking more water, right? This is something that we talk about all the time in health and fitness. It's almost as if we think of it as an afterthought now because obviously water is so crucial. However, we oftentimes get this wrong. For example, did you know that when it comes to hydration, just drinking water can make things worse? Most people don't know this. Why? Partly because most people are over drinking water and under consuming the electrolytes that help water do its job. What we don't realize is that hydration is not just about water. It's about electrolytes, the minerals in there, as well as getting that water into the cells. And so you do not want to be over consuming water if you're not getting your electrolytes right. And this opens up a whole new discussion because most people are not getting their electrolytes right. For example, did you know that low sodium, too low sodium is an issue? Just as much, if not more so, than high sodium. In other words, what we want if we're going to get the right electrolytes is to get the right amount of sodium and potassium and magnesium in the Goldilocks zone. We don't want too much. We don't want too little. We want it just right. This opens up a whole other thing here too because people who are exercising, doing sauna therapies, doing low carb diets are disrupting and losing lots and lots of their electrolytes. For example, when insulin is not around and low carb diets, you will excrete lots of sodium. In other words, under that state, exercising, low-carb diets, all these things, you actually need 
more sodium. And so if you're somebody who's been just drinking water, not paying attention to electrolytes and also feeling fatigued, feeling like you're underperforming, not sleeping right, getting cramps, twitches, headaches, any of these things, then you are probably dealing with an electrolyte issue. This is where the product element comes in. This product has been a game changer for me and many, many of my patients and clients. This is a rehydration electrolyte beverage, basically. It is a powder of electrolytes formulated with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium without the added sugar and other nonsense that comes in beverages like Gatorade. This stuff is basically a rehydration beverage on steroids. It is the thing that is going to replenish your electrolytes in the right ratios decrease fatigue, really correct chronic dehydration. And by the way, many people are dehydrating themselves, becoming hyponatremic, low sodium, when they're consuming too much water. You need your electrolytes on board, especially if you are someone who is losing lots of sodium and other electrolytes through low-carb diets and lots and lots of exercise. This is where Element comes in. Element is a new sponsor to the Next Level Human podcast. I cannot recommend this product enough. I have been using this stuff for months now and I have immediately seen changes in my energy levels. I feel like I'm operating on a whole other level and I have seen this as being the primary thing that people who have been using Element have been telling me that their fatigue is getting better, especially fatigue that comes after very intense workouts that involve lots of sweating and lots of intense output from the nervous system. Please check out Element. Use the code next level, drinkelement.com. That's D R I N K L M N T dot com. Drinkelement.com, and let's get back to the show. And so as a reminder, as you become a more resilient person, you have to be able to spot when you are stuck, when you have stuck emotions, when you're living in afraid, when recurrent obstacles come up, when repeated patterns happen again and again. This is where you begin to understand that I'm not being resilient and I'm holding myself back psychologically and rest assured where you go psychologically, you go physically in the same way that when you where you go physically is oftentimes where you go psychologically. In other words, what I'm trying to say is metabolism is both your psyche and your physical body. And you tell me, which one do you think drives more change? I'm suggesting that it is the psyche ultimately that drives more of the change. Now, one of the things with resilience is important for us to understand, and this is where uh, we have to understand it is difficult. We have to have empathy and compassion for people and give them each their own time in moving from a victim state to a hero state. Everyone's a little bit different and everyone has different resources, right? Think about someone who was raised with loving parents, had resources in terms of food on the table and monetary resources versus someone who was raised with just a mom and the mother is not at home and was food insecure and was having other environmental factors that were going on in their environment, violence and things like that. Who do you think is going to have more of a leg up in terms of resilience? Well, probably in most cases, the individual who had a loving family and monetary resources and a more safe environment. However, what's beautiful about this, and we all know, is that's not a guarantee. In other words, there are plenty of people that come from violent, traumatic uh, exposure to stress with insecure homes who are the most resilient people in the world. There's also people who come from these homes that have everything that become, you know, uh, coddled and uh, victim mindsets. And so this is why I make the point that ultimately it does come down to a choice that people make. And this, the reason I'm confronting you with this right now is because I want to ask you, it comes down to a choice. And I oftentimes think, and I do believe this, 
that suffering sometimes when you get knocked down to your lowest rung, this is oftentimes the catalyst that makes people finally go, okay, enough and move from resistance to resilience, right? It really is. And so oftentimes it's a choice and that choice is oftentimes forced on us by life. Think about it. Life has a way of tapping you on the shoulder, then smacking you across the face and then kicking you in the gut as hard as it can if you're not paying attention and not listening. And what the research actually shows on resilience is there are many, many strengths that we can have here. One of the most important strengths that we can have when it comes to resilience is purpose. And that's why episode uh, 187 is so critical for you to go back and review when you think about this particular episode and listening to this episode. Now, I want to stop here really quickly and just do some definitions really quickly. What's the difference between courage, resolve, resilience and grit? Well, courage really is this idea of having strength in the face of pain or grief or hardship. It's the ability to carry out an action despite being stuck and afraid, right? And so courage is a big piece of resilience, but it's not entirely the whole idea of resilience. Resolve is sort of the determination to do something, right? And so when you have courage, this strength to face pain and grief and hardship, with resolve, this determination to do something, now you're getting closer to what resilience is, which is the ability to maintain this healthy physical or psychological functioning despite significant adversity. This is really important. And why would you have this ability in the first place? If you're getting your ass beat constantly, you keep getting kicked. Why would anyone get back up? Why wouldn't anyone just throw in the towel and just be like, this is all empty and meaningless? The reason would be to have purpose. Purpose is what animates resilience. And so when you think about grit, right, to me, it's really purpose and resilience over the long term. It's resilience plus purpose. That's ultimately what grit is. People who have a reason and a passion to be resilient in the first place. And so you really cannot have resilience without having purpose. Now are you seeing how powerful this is? So let's talk about a brief study here. And this study is titled Childhood Adversity, Midlife Generativity, and Later Life, and Later Life Well-Being. And in this study, which is a review study, it basically talks about the idea that resilience is not going to eliminate the negative aspects of, aspects of hardship. In other words, resilience does not, having resilience doesn't take away the pain. You're not going to be able to get out of this life without pain and suffering. That's just and hurt. That's just the way it is. So being resilient does not eliminate pain. What it does is it allows yourself to pick yourself back up and reengage in spite of pain. That's what real resilience does. And in this study, this term generativity really is synonymous with purpose. It is a trait that begins to put effort and care into the well-being of others. So isn't this interesting that generativity is a concern for people besides myself and my family? It's a desire to help guide the next generation. And this generativity or purpose is highly correlated to resilience. So what's beautiful about this is not only does hardship, trauma, suffering, confront us with a choice of whether we're going to be resilient or whether we're going to be in resistance. But it also makes very clear from the research that once you start to be resilient, once you do start picking yourself back up, something transcendent begins to happen. All of a sudden, you begin to have compassion and empathy and purpose, not just for yourself, but for other people. So what I am actually suggesting here is that pain and hardship and difficulty is the generator to being a next level human. It is something that points you to something transcendent about life, something very different, something that allows us to have a sense of fulfillment, something that allows us to see our life is more than what we actually think, that we are important, that we do matter, and that our struggles, in fact, are the very thing that make us most precious to the human ecosystem. 
Because that's what we're in. We're in a human ecosystem. Each of us matter. And our suffering and our trauma and our hurt and our difficulty actually is the thing that will point us to how we matter and how we can make a difference. Because rest assured, you are living a story and you're living, in fact, many stories. And the fact is that trauma and suffering and difficulty are going to force you to confront those stories and to rewrite those stories. And the degree to which you are able to rewrite those stories and become a better human is the degree to which you will make life matter and make a difference and make the world better for other people, not just yourself. And I oftentimes like to say, you know, if you believe life is a war and that's the story you're telling, you're going to see battles everywhere, right? That's what you're going to see. However, if you believe that life is a battle and you are the uh, healer, right? You are the medical technician. You are the person who, you know, shows up and helps people survive. You're going to see things differently. And if you believe that life is a video game and it's all about leveling up, you're going to see life very differently. Those beliefs can make you more psychologically resilient, can they not? Now, the final thing I want to get into here is something that's very important, because if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully, very astutely, you should be asking yourself, OK, Jade, I get it, but I'm confronted with things in life that are difficult. And I don't always know what's the best approach. I have been burned. People have been mean to me. I have been betrayed. I have had hurts. And I am trying to grow from those. But I tend to make choices. And and what you're telling me, Jade, is that I tend to make choices that are more familiar. Uh, But how do I know when I'm confronted with something like a new relationship that looks maybe the same? I have a choice between this person A and this person B. And which direction do I go here? Or I have a choice between this career and A and this career B or staying in a career A and being an entrepreneur B. Like, how do I make sense of these choices? And what I would suggest is that your emotions really often tell you an awful lot about this. So what I would say is anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity and depression, this afraid acronym we talked about, when you feel more of these It's a good indication from my perspective that that choice is probably not the best thing for you. However, if you feel more excitement, discomfort, yes, a little bit of fear, uncertainty, but it comes along with possibility and hope, this might be a better place for you to go. So if you're left with two choices and one choice immediately elicits anger, frustration, resistance, anxiety, insecurity, and depression, And the other choice is uh, presenting you with excitement, discomfort, fear, uncertainty, possibility and hope Then you may want to move in the direction of excitement, discomfort, fear, uncertainty, possibility and hope. And notice that discomfort, fear and uncertainty, these are not necessarily positive emotions, right? They can seem very similar to insecurity, anxiety and resistance, right? So how do you know? Because these two are a little bit different. So what happens is once you make the choice, right? So one choice might be more fear based, but be familiar to you and may have more certainty and more comfort in it versus the other one may have that same fear, but it's more foreign, uncertain and uncomfortable. What I'm suggesting to you is that you will always go towards more familiarity, more certainty and more comfort. But a resilient person, someone who's trying to, uh, you know, sort of uh, build resilience is probably going to start to recognize that, okay, this looks more foreign. This looks more uncertain and more uncomfortable. The other thing, they both have fear associated with them, but the other thing is more familiar. It looks like something I've done before. It's more comfortable. I would suggest to the degree that which you can is to begin to move in the direction of things that are fearful, foreign, uncertain, and a little bit uncomfortable that come with a bit of hope and excitement. This idea that, oh, my gosh, that is a little bit scary for me, but it's also very different and I might learn a ton and I could grow from that versus this is a little bit scary, but not as scary and it's more familiar and comfortable. So I think I'll go here and maybe I won't learn as much. So when I like to make decisions and I'm working with people in this regard and teaching resilience, I'm more of the mindset of go where the growth is.
as scary as that is, because it's going to be scary on both hands. What would you rather do? Repeat old patterns and deal with the same old difficulty and be stuck and afraid or be a little bit scary, grow and get out of those old patterns? Of course, most of us would choose the latter. And that is what determines resilience. Now, how do we do this? Right. Uh, to wrap up this particular podcast, how do we do this? Well, many people like to talk about this idea of the law of attraction. You probably heard about this or read the book or the documentary. And this idea is, you know what? You want something different in life. You're tired of repeating these same patterns, these stuck emotions. You don't want to live in afraid anymore. And so the idea is to begin to think about how you do want your life to be. And the universe supposedly, quote, hears you and, you know, quote, answers your prayers. In other words, the idea of the law of attraction is that thoughts become things, right? You probably heard this idea. The problem with this idea, though, and it's not completely incorrect, I just think it's uh, not complete, is that thoughts alone don't help you feel different. If you're someone who's never been able to feel differently than afraid and you're always stuck and afraid, then what makes you think your thoughts are immediately going to allow you to feel something different? You need to naturally feel something. You need your thinking and your feeling in alignment. Now, what is the best way to get your thinking and feeling in alignment? Well, if you act a particular way, that is going to align thinking and feeling. In other words, you can think a thing and not act it. You can feel a thing and not necessarily act it. So this idea of fake it until you make it is not the right idea. It's really be it until you see it. So it's not the law of attraction. It's the law of recognition. And the law of recognition basically works like this. Let's say you want to, the example I always use is buy a red Tesla. And let's say before you're aware of wanting to get a red Tesla, you didn't think about Teslas. You weren't aware of them. But as soon as you decide, I think I'm going to buy a Tesla and I think I want a red one. All of a sudden, red Teslas start showing up everywhere. You start seeing Teslas all the time and an inexplicable amount of those Teslas turn out to be red. Now, the law of attraction would say something along the lines of you just manifest these. They just popped into reality. The law of recognition would say they were there all along your brain has now just primed to them and you started to recognize them now. And we all know what this is like. You read a particular book, you watch a particular movie, you you meet a particular person and it shifts you in a way and things that you didn't know you didn't know become an awareness that you now have. And this is how we grow as humans. So what we want to be thinking about is we want to be thinking about this idea of being it until you see it. Fake it until you make it means I'll think the thing, I'll pretend the thing, and when people are watching me, I'll be the thing. But as soon as they're not watching me, I'm going to go back to doing what I did before. If you really want to build resilience and growth and become the thing that you want to become and escape the stuck emotions of afraid, you have to be the thing when people are watching. And more importantly, you have to be the thing when they're not watching. So you need to be it until you see it. So one of the, the, the reasons that I started talking about this idea of be it until you see it is because it is a clear distinction from fake it until you make it. You want to act, think, and feel in alignment. And that is the definition of being. So how do you do that? Well, you start acting like a method actor. A method actor is someone who doesn't just play a role. They're not faking it. They actually become that role. They act as if they are that thing from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed. In fact, They even start dreaming as if they were that perceptual awareness. And this is how you escape resistance. And this is how you begin acting as if and enter what uh, I would call the confidence, competence, courage loop. If you have courage to act, you will develop some confidence. You will then develop some competence, which gives you more, more courage. Or we can start with confidence. If you take confidence and succeed and get more competence, you'll develop some courage. Or you can start with competence, right? If I can develop some knowledge, some competence around something, that will give me more confidence and courage, and they all feed back on each other. And this is how this works. It's not fake it until you make it. It's be it until you see it. 
Faking it doesn't build resilience. Being it builds resilience. And this means that we have to confront our fears. And again, I want to break down a common acronym that people use for fear, false expectations appearing real. I don't think that this idea of fear is useful at all. Fear is not false expectations appearing real because let's face it, there is real danger in the world. There are really things that you should be afraid of. However, when you think of fear, I think you need to be thinking of it as find, engage, and resolve. You need to stick your toe in the waters of fear. You don't want to jump in the pool. You stick your water in. You have some success. You build some resilience. Then you stick your foot in. Then you stick your leg in, right? You slowly expose yourself. And this is what we do when we're doing psychology with people who are building resilience. We use exposure therapy. In fact, there's research on arachnophobes, people who are afraid of spiders, who use exposure therapy, a stepwise fashion of finding, engaging, and resolving their fear by first learning a little bit about spiders, developing some competence about spiders. Second, watching a video about spiders, seeing them on a TV screen, building a little bit of more competence and a little bit more courage and confidence around understanding how spiders move. And then seeing spiders behind a cage, protective glass. Then being in the same room with a spider, but the spider's in a protective container that's covered. And then being in the same room and taking the top off of the container, then being in the same room and touching the spider with a big, long stick, and then being in the same room with the spider and actually at the end of these studies, holding an actual tarantula. And this is a exposure therapy that has been done inside of two hours, taking people who are terrified of spiders in a two hour session and actually getting a very high percent of them to actually hold the spider. And these uh, extinction of this fear can last up to six months later. This is how powerful developing a resilient mindset can be. So how do you do this? I call it a fear PR. You pick any fear, any fear, any small fear, and you begin to chip away at it. So for example, a fear of sharks. Your first approach in dealing with this fear, fear, fear PR number one, might be watching Shark Week, watching TV about this. Fear PR number two might be going and swimming in the ocean. Fear PR number three might be getting certified in scuba and going scuba diving in deeper water. Fear PR number 10 might be swimming with trained shark divers with sharks swimming around you. And in between, maybe you do some cage diving or whatever. This is how people overcome their fears. Flying, right? Maybe you first watch about flying, learn more about flying, fly you know, on a regular plane, then fly in long distance, then fly over the ocean, then do some skydiving, et cetera, right? One very simple way of doing this, and I always oftentimes like to use this, is the fear of being alone. How would you chunk this fear down? Well, you can essentially start by going to see a movie, something pretty easy or a little bit anxiety ridden when you first go into the movie theater. But then, you know, you essentially uh, are sidetracked by the film and then you have a little bit more anxiety when you leave. That would be fear PR number one of being, you know, a fear of, you know, sort of being uh, around people, uh, fear of, you know, sort of agoraphobia or being alone, right? Doing things alone, rather. So not agoraphobia. Agoraphobia would be fear of crowds. We're talking about fear of being alone here. Um, so fear PR number two might be go out to eat alone. Uh, fear PR number three might be go out to eat alone without your phone. So you you can't be distracted. Fear PR number four might be you know, go for a hike alone, go for a weekend alone uh, somewhere. Fear PR level 10 might be go to Paris where you don't speak the language, stay a week by yourself, maneuver around the city. Think about how this would build resilience. This is how we begin to make ourselves more resilient and understand that when we have a deep purpose, we have this engine that drives resilience. Life is about learning, teaching, and loving. We oftentimes talk about this. How can we do that if we are stuck in old stories, if we are stuck and afraid, if we don't 
develop resilience. And how can we develop resilience if we don't have purpose? And so this to me is how we begin to make change. To be resilient, we must confront uncertainty and discomfort. We must see hurt, hardships, traumas, trials, tribulations as fuel for growth. And slowly over time, as we expose ourselves to these things, we escape the victim mindset, move into the hero mindset, develop some confidence and competence and courage that builds on itself. And before we know it, we are a different human being who has resilience, who can grow, who has some self-autonomy, who doesn't completely outsource their sense of work and who has a deep purpose and knows that we matter and can make a difference in the world. I hope today's episode was useful for you. Uh, please uh, let me know how you liked the episode. I would love it if you send me a DM uh, on any of the social medias or send an email to support at jtita.com. I'd love to hear your feedback. And as always, please consider giving a review for the podcast. Your reviews really help get other people interested in finding the podcast. It would be amazing if you'd go over to Apple Podcasts and submit a five-star review there or whatever review you like. I want your feedback and I really appreciate you um, enjoying uh, the podcast and showing up here. Thanks so much and I'll see you all at the next episode.